that I've been lamenting all along in this, uh, in this course, the weakness of methods in humans. They're cool, it's wonderful when you can learn things, but there's so much we can't see. Well, luckily, macaques have face systems that look a lot like human face systems. And there's a huge amount you can learn about the macaque face system. Lots of people are working on this now, and the work started with Doris Tsao and Venrich Freivald uh, around 15 years ago. So I'm just going to briefly sketch what those guys did. The first thing they did, well, so first let me orient you in a monkey brain. So that's an eyeball, the side view of a monkey brain like this, not that different from a human brain, about a third the volume. There's the temporal lobe, just where it is in humans. The bottom part of the temporal lobe is called infratemporal cortex. Um, and so the standard method is to put an electrode right into the monkey brain, usually through a hole in the skull. Of the, the skull. Again, there's no pain sensors in the brain, so if this is done right, the animal doesn't have to experience any pain because the skull hole is made on, with anesthesia. Um, and to record neural activity uh, in the form of action potentials or neural spikes over time as the monkey looks at different things. Okay? Okay. So for example, you show a monkey face to the monkey and you record uh, neural activity or you show a hand. And this method has been used for a long time or a scrambled face. Uh, and way back in 1972, Charlie Gross, shown here, discovered the first face selective cells in monkeys using this method. So here's that, <clears throat> that her cell. This is the time course of response of that cell when this stimulus was presented for those two seconds right there. Okay, so you can see that neuron fires a whole bunch when that face is presented, right? and it doesn't fire a whole bunch when a hand is presented. So it's not just anything animate or anything, um, anything uh, I don't know, primatological. <laughs> and so they tested all kinds of different things. Smiley face, kind of, sort of, random lines, not really. Scrambled face, not really. Faces without eyes, a little bit, etc. cetera. Okay? Human faces, although Charlie Gross is uh, kind of battling for looking like a monkey face, and especially this whole picture. Um, strong response. Okay, so this is the first face selective cell ever found. Actually, I think Charlie Gross was in this department back when it was the psychology department doing the, that experiment. Um, okay, since then, dozens of people have followed this up and recorded all over the side of the temporal lobe, lots and lots of studies. Um, those are all locations where um, face selective cells have been recorded. Uh, much of this work is by David Parrott, who does all kinds of fascinating stuff. Hopefully, we'll hear more about it. Um, later. Uh, and the general consensus, uh, circa 1995, um, was that the highest density of face selective cells you could find anywhere in the temporal lobe of monkeys was around 10 to 20 percent of cells that were face selective in any one patch. Okay? So that was the consensus. But of course, when you do single unit recording with an electrode, you're just kind of sticking it in where somebody else said over here might be good, you think it might be good over there. You're sampling one location at a time. It's easy to miss the goods. And these guys missed the goods. That's why they thought the highest density of cells that were face selective was 10 to 20%. Yeah? OK. So what Doris and Vinrick did was to do functional MRI experiments in monkeys, just like we do in humans. They put the monkeys like in a little, they're in the scanner like this, uh, and they're looking at stimuli just like we humans do, stimuli like these, and they present faces and blank and objects over time to the monkeys just as we do for humans. Okay? And what they found is that this is now an inflated view of the side of the monkey brain. So you take a folded up monkey brain and you mathematically inflate it so you can see the whole cortex. The dark bits are the bits that used to be inside a fold that got pushed out when you inflated it mathematically, not physically. You don't stick a straw in the brain and blow. <laughs> mathematically undo it. Um, and what you see is six yellow blobs that all respond more to faces than objects. Okay? Every one of those yellow blobs, posterior one, two middle ones, three anterior ones, going along the temporal lobe in monkeys that all respond more to faces than objects. Okay? So that's pretty cool. This was in 2003 they, they reported this. It made me pretty damn happy because, you know, human researchers always feel like, oh, we have the crappy methods. We're always behind the animal research. But this time, we got there first, and they copied us. Yes. Um, but not just that we got there first. Even better, because they found these, um, these patches in monkeys. They could then do what we can't do in humans. 
which is stick electrodes directly into one of those patches and record from all the neurons they found in there. Something I would just like, I actually think about sticking an electrode in there to know what the neurons do. I'm not quite ready to yet, but I so want to know, and I can't know in humans, but these guys can find out in monkeys, and that's awesome. Okay? So when they did that, um, they recorded from neur individual neurons, now sticking electrodes directed straight into that patch found first with functional MRI. I'm going to skip the video, but it's right there. You can go and watch it online. It's pretty cool. What they found is that in two different monkeys, the vast majority of the neurons responded nearly exclusively to faces. So here are 16 different faces, 16 different bodies, fruits, gadgets, hands, and scrambled um, stimuli. And this is the average response uh, of over all the neurons, one or 200 neurons in each of two monkeys, of the neurons found inside that face patch identified with functional MRI. Okay? So what you see here is a damned face selective response. Everybody see that? Notice that this is not just face selective. This is nearly face exclusive. Unlike functional MRI, where you see a partial response to um, non-face objects. Go think about why that might be. Why might it be that we see stronger selectivity with single neurons than you see with functional MRI? Yeah, OK, I'm going to stop at one sec. OK. So um, there is some of these things produce a partial response. They tend to be round. Cool, huh? OK. Uh, we'll skip that. Um, so how does this go beyond the human work? And I'll just briefly say there are many advantages uh, of monkey research. One, we can precisely characterize the neural code. Um, we can record from hundreds of individual neurons in a face patch or any other region, and we re can record their response each to hundreds of different stimuli. Okay, so that's a very, very precise representation of the neural code that we can't even remotely approach in humans. Okay, and so there's lots of fancy math you can apply to these data that really tell you uh, what that code uh, represents, and we'll get to that later. Okay? Also, there is no method that, that in humans that can approach this spatial and temporal resolution. We're recording from individual neurons. We have very precise time information at the level of milliseconds or better, and we know exactly where we are in the brain, and we're recording from a single neuron. It doesn't get close to that in humans. Um, the particular method where you do functional MRI in monkeys first, find where the action is, and then direct electrodes there, is very powerful. Remember, all those guys who were recording face-selective cells for 20 years didn't believe there was a face-selective patch, because they just never happened to hit the right spot. If you do functional MRI first, you find the hot spots, and then you do the neurophysiology, then you're really in a strong, that's a very powerful combination of methods. Um, and of course, there are numerous kinds of causal tests you can do in a monkey, from electrical stimulation, much as the neurosurgeons sometimes do in humans, to um, you can drip drugs on that location, you can um, do optogenetics, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can also discover the actual structural connectivity of that brain region to other parts of the brain, something totally cool for which methods in humans are lousy. Um, disadvantages, it's slow and expensive. Um, and there is this question, okay, it's a monkey. We want to know how human vision works. How similar is it? And that's an important question. There are things you can do about that. And reasonable people can be concerned about the ethics, as I mentioned. 